we are glad that you are here, that you are at least tuning into our video. Uh, we hope that uh, this coronavirus, if there's any positive effect that comes from it, that it will help you long to be here. Because we long to see you guys in these pews, and not just the couple people that are here as we film the video on Saturday. Uh, we, we are so excited to, to worship the Lord this morning. Um, but we're going to begin the service with prayer. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for just this opportunity to worship you, this opportunity to hear from your word. God, I pray that all that we would do uh, here and in our homes uh, would be glorifying to you. We thank you for allowing us to do this. We pray that um, you would bring us back soon. In Jesus' name, amen.
Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. You rejoice in this, even though now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials, so that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which, though perishable, is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though not seeing him now, you believe in him, and you rejoice with the inexpressible and glorious joy, because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your soul. begin our new series entitled Contagious Joy. Contagious Joy. This series will take us through Paul's letter to the Philippians. And if I'm being honest, I think you will be hard pressed to find a book in the Bible that is as centered on joy as Paul's letter to the Philippians. And so I'm excited for us to begin this series. I'm excited for us to grow in our joy as believers. And this morning we begin this series in Philippians 1 verses 1 through 11. Philippians 1, verses 1 through 11. One of the great all-time American classic movies is The Karate Kid. I'm not talking about that remake with Jackie Chan and Jane Smith. I'm talking about The Karate Kid with Pat Morita, Ralph Macchio, and Billy Zafka. That is the classic Karate Kid. 
It's a classic story about how Daniel needs to overcome his bullies from the Cobra Kai dojo. He's having an issue with them until Mr. Miyagi comes and defends him from one of their beatings. Well, a series of events takes place to where Daniel has to enter this martial arts tournament in order to overcome his fear and overcome his bullies. So Mr. Miyagi agrees to train Daniel on the condition that Daniel commits unequivocally to everything in Miyagi's curriculum and he obeys every one of his instructions without question. So Daniel agrees and Mr. Miyagi assigns Daniel to complete various Lengthy and menial chores. And think wax on, wax off. This appears to have nothing to do with martial arts. Daniel begins to get frustrated, wondering what is the point of everything he's doing. And he actually gets so frustrated that he accuses Mr. Miyagi of trying to get free labor out of him. And at one point, Mr. Miyagi actually attacks Daniel, but Daniel's able to fend him off due to the chores that he had done. You see, every chore that Daniel had done was giving him muscle memory, was training his muscles to react in a certain way. And Daniel realized that every chore he was supposed to do actually had purpose. That every single thing that Mr. Miyagi told him to do was to grow him into the person he needed to be to win that tournament. And he won that tournament, even though he used an illegal crane kick, but we won't talk about that. But Daniel was able to win that tournament because of the menial task that Miyagi had him do. Every one of those tasks was to grow him into who he needed to be. And once he realized that, he didn't find those chores to be menial or pointless. And I feel like many of us as believers are kind of stuck where Daniel was before he realized what the point was. Many of us in our growth as believers, we, we feel like it's pointless or joyless. And the things that we do as believers are just menial chores or tasks to do. And the reason we feel this way is because we often don't see an immediate result. We don't see immediate uh, external evidence that what we're doing is working. For example, when we read the Bible, we expect God every single time to change our lives drastically. And when it doesn't happen, we wonder, what's the point? Or when we pray, we expect God to answer our prayers right then and there in the exact way that we want him to. And when he doesn't, we think this is pointless. Or maybe when we share the gospel with somebody, we expect somebody to get saved every single time we share the gospel with them. But when they don't, we think this is pointless. And the reason we think this way is really due to our culture. You see, we live in a culture of immediate satisfaction, of getting immediately what we want. Whether, that's where we, whether we order something from a restaurant or that we do any kind of task, we want immediate evidence that this is working. And for example, when we're hungry, we don't go grab a crock pot and put a pot roast in it and try to satisfy our hunger right then and there. Why? Because a pot roast takes time. A crock pot process takes a few hours. So what do we do? We grab a frozen burrito from the freezer and we put it in the microwave. So we can have fulfillment right then and there. But let's be honest. Which one of those things is going to taste better? Is the frozen burrito you put in the microwave going to taste better than a pot roast that's had time to simmer in a crock pot? Wow. The pot roast is going to take, taste so much better, but the reason why we often think things are pointless in the Christian lives is because we often want a microwave process and we don't realize that Christianity and growing as a believer is a crock pot process. We may not see immediate results, we may not see immediate evidence that this is working, but it is. The results we want may take time, but it's worth it. In the same way we put a pot roast in a crock pot, you can smell that it's cooking. You can smell that the desired result is coming. And as Christians, the more we pursue Christ, the more we grow in Christ, we may not get the result right then and there, but we can tell it's working. And we can tell that, especially when we find joy in our growth. This is exactly what Paul is getting at here in Philippians 1, verses 1 through 11. He's telling the Philippian church to find joy in their growth. He's encouraging them to find joy in their growth because there's a point to their growth. It's not meaningless. It's not pointless. There is a goal. There is a point to it. And because of that, they can find joy in it. And so you and I as believers, we can also find joy in our growth when we realize what Paul is saying here in Philippians 1, verses 1 through 11. What we see in this passage is that there is joy in growth if we will quit being passive in our growth 
and become active in it. So let's see what Paul says here in Philippians, beginning in verse 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God for every remembrance of you, always praying with joy for all of you in my every prayer. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Indeed, it is right for me to think this way about all of you because I have you in my heart. And you are all my partners with me in grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how deeply I miss all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And I pray this, that your love will keep on growing in knowledge and every kind of discernment, so that you may approve the things that are superior and may be pure and blameless in the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Here in this passage of Scripture, we see two actions that we are to take in order to be active in our growth process, in order for us to find joy in our growth. And the first action is that we need to have assurance in the God who grows us. We need to have assurance in the God who grows us. See, we could say that Philippians is essentially Paul's love letter to the church at Philippi. He is so encouraged by them, he is commending them for what they've done. And he says here in verse 1, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Right from the get-go, Paul established what the main theme of this letter is going to be, that everything he says is going to be grounded in Christ. How do we know this? When you read verses 1 and 2, you notice that he says Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ three times in the first two verses. Everything he's about to say is grounded in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Everything that he says to the praise of Jesus Christ. He's grounding his letter already in what the major theme is going to be. And he's saying that everything he's going to say is grounded in the person and work of Christ. That joy is only found in Jesus alone. But then he goes on in verse 3 to say, I give thanks to my God for every remembrance of you, always praying with joy for all of you in my every prayer. See, this letter is not like Galatians where Paul is angry with the church for giving into false teaching. Paul is so thankful for this church. Like I said, this could be called a love letter to the Philippians. It says, I give thanks to my God for every remembrance of you. Because every single time that he thinks of the Philippian church, he is thanking God for them. Paul loves this church. I mean, why wouldn't he? he is the, it is the first church that he established in Europe. We see this in Acts 16, verses 6 through 40. Paul established this church. He loves this church, and they have partnered with him in the Gospels. Which is why he loves them. They support him. They encourage him. And so every time he prays for them, it's always in joy because of who they are. And he's so thankful for them because of their partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. From the first day that Paul established this church to even at this very moment where Paul is imprisoned. See, they've actually sent him a financial contribution, some support during his time in prison. They've supported Paul. They've been praying for Paul. They've been encouraging Paul. And Paul is saying that I am so thankful for you. He's so thankful for them. He loves them. But we can't think that Paul is just thankful for them, that he has joy in them and confidence in them just because the Philippian church does a lot of great works. Yes, they are doing good works, but Paul has joy and confidence in the Philippian church, not because of their good works, but because he can tell that in the midst of their good works, they are doing these good works because of the work that God is doing in them. Paul can tell that God is working in their lives. And he says in verse 6, I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Paul is saying, I'm so thankful for you for your partnership. And because of your partnership, because of your encouragement, because of how you live out the gospel, I know the work God has begun in you, he will complete. In verse 7 he says, indeed it is right for me to think this way about all of you. Because I have you in my heart, and you are all my partners with me in grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. 
So Paul is saying here, verses 1 through 7, that he has assurance in the Philippian church. He has confidence and joy in the Philippian church because he has joy and confidence and assurance in the God that is working through the church. Paul's assurance is not just found in the good works the church does. Paul's assurance is found in the God who is working through this church, through their good works. And verse 6 is an amazing source of assur assurance for all believers. I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. What is Paul talking about here? What is this good work that's begun in them? Well, remember, Paul is writing this to believers in Philippi. He's not just writing it to the city of Philippi. He's writing it to the believers who are gathering together. He's, he's writing it to the community of believers in Philippi. So what does that mean if they're believers? It means the work that's begun in them is the fact that they are saved. They have been washed clean of their iniquity by the blood of Christ shed on the cross. And they have been raised to walk in the newness of life because of his resurrection. And Paul is saying that this good work that's begun in you, God will bring to completion. So what's this work that God is doing in them? It's what we often call sanctification. You may see that word from time to time in your Bible. So what does sanctification mean? Well, sanctification is the ongoing supernatural work of God to rescue justified sinners from the disease of sin and to conform them to the image of his son, holy, Christ-like, and empowered to do good works. This is the work that God is doing in their lives. He is sanctifying them. He is making them more holy. He's conforming them more to the image of his son. He's conforming them more into the image of Christ. And Paul has complete confidence that the God who is doing this work in their lives, no matter what the future may hold for them, no matter what persecution may come, God will complete his work. This is the assurance that Paul has because he knows that God does not give up on his people. He knows no matter how far we may fall, no matter how epically we may fail, God does not give up on his people. This is the assurance that you and I have as believers because the whole process of sanctification means that you and I still have sin in the flesh that we're wrestling with. And there are going to be times in our life where we fail and we lose the battle against our flesh. But in those times, we don't need to worry, does God still love me? Has God given up on me? Because we have the assurance of verse 6 that the good work that he began in us, he will indeed complete. He does not give up on his people. No matter how hard we may fall, he does not give up on us. No matter how unfaithful we are to him, he is still faithful to us. It reminds me of those trust fall exercises, if you will, that some companies and groups do in order to build team morale and trust. Now, that's what they were intended for. But I had a buddy of mine in high school who got really fascinated with these trust falls. And so he decided to be hilarious that every time we were in a big group of people, he just yelled out, trust fall, crossed his hands across his chest, and then fell backwards until one of us caught him. Now, I'm a good friend, so I caught him every single time. But being honest, when I caught him, I was secretly wondering how funny would it be if I just let him drop and hit the ground. And I often thought, maybe I should let him fall and hit the ground, because this is really annoying. But one day, I got so annoyed with this, I decided it was good for him to get a taste of his own medicine. So, in a big group of people at school, with everyone watching, I yelled at the top of my lungs, trust fall, and then proceeded to fall backwards. And he didn't catch me. He stepped to the side, so I fell right on the ground, hurt myself, and was embarrassed in front of at least 100 people. And I was mad. I was hurt. I was embarrassed. When I looked up at him, he looked at me and said, my bad. Like, that, that's not a good friend. He didn't catch me even though I caught him. I was embarrassed. I was in pain. I was mad. And I feel like a lot of the times when we fall as Christians, when we fail, we fall short of the glory of God, we may wonder, is God actually going to catch me this time? But God's not like my friend who didn't catch me. In better news, God's not like me who caught my friend but wondered, maybe I should let him drop this time. You see, when we fall, God picks us up, he catches us, and there's never a moment where he wonders, maybe I should let them fall. No, God is faithful to us even when we are unfaithful to him. God always catches us, he picks us up, he renews us, he restores us, and he says, let's go at it again. That's how great our God is. That's the assurance that we have in our God. He is the one who is growing. This is the work that he is doing, and he is going to carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. 
We can have great assurance in our great God that he is going to do what he promises he's going to do. That he's not going to let us fall. That there is nothing in all this creation that can separate us from him and his power, his work, and his love. In fact, Romans 8, 38-39 says just that. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. No matter what happens in this life, no matter how you feel right now, no matter what continues to happen with COVID-19, no matter how, fall, how, how hard you may fall, there is nothing that will separate you from the love of God. There is nothing that will then cause God to say, you know what, I'm not going to finish the work I started in them. God is too great, he is too powerful, and he is too good and faithful to not finish the work that he has begun in us as believers. This is the assurance that Paul has. This is the assurance that you and I have as believers. That as we grow in Christ, as we grow in Christ's life, as we grow in holiness, as we battle the flesh, God is the one growing us, and he will do the work that he has promised he will do. So you and I have this assurance we can have joy in our growth knowing no matter what happens, God's got us. This enables us to be able to pray with joy for others and ourselves. It enables us to focus on the joy that we have in Christ. So we're not, we're not worrying, does God still love me? Does God still want me? No, God will finish the work that he began in you. You are sustained by his power. And so we can be assured in the God who grows us. We can have joy in the God who grows us. We can have joy in our growth because we know how great our God is. If you want to have joy and growth, we need to have assurance in the God who grows us. This is what Paul is writing here in verses 1 through 7. And there is great joy to be found in our growth as we have assurance in this God. There is great joy that enables us to actually grow as we were intended to in Christ. It enables us to have joy. This assurance also enables us to be aware of the goal of our growth. Be aware of the goal of your growth. You see, Paul says here in verse 8, For God is my witness, how deeply I miss all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. So before Paul explains what he's praying for the church, he grounds this prayer in the love that he has for them. He misses them. He longs to be with them. I feel like right now we might be able to sympathize with that on a deeper level than we ever could. I hope you miss being able to gather together. I hope you long for the day we can gather together again, because I do. And everyone in this room who's with me does. I hope we long for the day that we can be together again. I hope that our affection for each other is still evident. But here's the thing, too. Even though we can't gather, you can still pray for each other. You can still encourage one another. Paul may not be with the Philippian church, but he's still telling them, hey, I'm praying for you. And in verse 9, he explains what this prayer is. He said, and I pray this, that your love will keep on growing in knowledge and every kind of discernment. So what is Paul's prayer? that the Philippian church would continue to grow in love. They would continue to grow in Christ. And as they grow in love, they would also grow in their knowledge and every kind of discernment. See, growing in your love for Christ is not separate from knowledge or discernment. No, love, knowledge, and discernment are all interwoven, interwoven together. You see, as we grow in our love for Christ, we grow in our love for him because we grow in our knowledge of him. Not just about him, but our knowledge of him. As we grow in our knowledge of him, we grow in our knowledge of the gospel. As we grow in our knowledge of the gospel, we grow in our knowledge of what the gospel calls us to do. And we grow in love that we desire to do what the gospel calls us to do. That we desire Jesus more. That we desire the gospel more. That we want to do what the gospel calls us to do. And so that we may discern what the gospel calls us to do and what the world calls us to do. So that we may discern what is righteous and what is unrighteous, what is holy and what is unholy, what leads to life and what leads to death. This is best characterized by the blessed man found in Psalm 1. How happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked or stand in the pathway with sinners or sit in the company of mockers. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction and he meditates on it day and night. He is like a tree planted beside flowing streams that bears its fruit in its season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. The wicked are not like this. Instead, they are all like chaff that the wind blows away. 
Therefore, the wicked will not stand up in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to ruin. So what is Paul's prayer for the Wolfian church? They would grow in their delight in the Lord's instruction. They would grow in their love for God, their love for each other, their love for knowledge of who God is in the gospel is. And they would be able to discern what leads to life and what leads to death. What leads to eternal satisfaction and what gives temporary fulfillment. This is Paul's prayer for the church. He prays this, but he also prays this with two goals in mind. He didn't just end there at verse 9. He says there are two goals that come with this prayer. So what are all these goals? Well, verse 10 says so that you may approve the things that are superior. So what's the first goal of the Philippian church? Growing in their love. What's the first goal of them? Growing their love, knowledge, and discernment. That they may approve the things that are superior. Or a better way to put it may be so they may grow to desire the things that God desires for them. They may grow in knowing what God desires for the church. They will approve of the things that glorify God. They will approve, approve of the things that lead to eternal life, that lead to satisfaction, not just temporary fulfillment. They may approve of the things superior. How do we do that? Well, Romans 12, verse 2 actually tells us, Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. So the goal Paul has in mind here is that it will be renewed in their minds. They will approve of what is pleasing to God, what is the perfect will of God. They will approve that which is superior. This is the goal in mind when Paul says, I pray this for you, that you may approve that which is superior. You may approve that which God desires. You may approve of that which glorifies God. You may desire that which is better than what this world offers. That's the first goal of Paul's prayer. The second goal is this. It may be, may be pure and blameless in the day of Christ. Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, the glory and praise of God. So Paul's first goal of this prayer is that they may approve what is superior. His second goal is this, they may be found pure and blameless on the day of Christ. The day when Christ returned. They may be found pure and blameless. Now, here's what Paul isn't saying here. Paul isn't saying that if they don't grow, if they don't, if they don't grow in their love and knowledge and discernment as Christians, they somehow will lose their salvation. And there's a possibility they'll be found uh, unrighteous, impure, and be full of blood on the day of Christ. He's not saying that believers can somehow lose or have their status changed before God because of a bad day or because of them falling short. What he's praying here is this, that as these Philippian believers grow, that as these Christians grow in their love, as they begin to approve what is superior, they will also grow in their confidence of their status when Christ returns. They will be confident that before Christ, when Christ returns, they will be found pure and blameless. Why? Because they have been washed clean of their sins. They have been justified before a holy God because of the blood of Jesus. They are no longer alienated and hostile in mind, but now they are holy and blameless because of the work of Christ. That is their status for a holy God. And Paul's prayer is that as they grow, as they approve that which is superior, they will grow in confidence. They may be pure and blameless in the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, the glory and praise of God. This is what Paul has in mind. This is the goal he has in mind. He's praying for the Philippians. There is a goal to their growth. But we need to be careful here. Because while Paul is desiring for these Christians, these believers, to grow in their confidence of their status before Christ, this is also a word of warning to those who aren't truly in Christ. Talking about those who may profess outwardly to know Jesus, but inwardly there's never been a relationship with Jesus. Inwardly, inwardly they've been transformed by the gospel, they've been transformed by Christ. They haven't had their status changed. They haven't been uh, transformed to be in Christ or incorporated in Christ. They are false believers. Do they stand pure and blameless on the day of Christ? No. Jesus actually details what will happen to those false people on, in Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Drive out demons in your name? And do many miracles in your name? Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. So what Christ is saying here is that those who are false, those who don't really have a relationship with Jesus Christ, they will not be found here in blameless my day when he returns. 
He'll tell them to depart from him, for he never knew them. But Paul says here that those who are in Christ, those who are believers, those who are in the process of sanctification, those who are being grown by God, those who are being worked on and worked through by God, they can have confidence that on that day they will be found pure and blameless. And they will not go to eternal separation from the love and grace of God. But they will spend eternity with Christ because of the work that Christ has done. This is the goal of their growth. To grow in confidence, to know that there is a point to all of this. To grow in Christ's likeness. To approve the things that are superior and to be pure and blameless on the day of Christ. And if, we are, if you are in Christ and you're listening, then we can have assurance that we will be found pure and blameless on the day of Christ. Because we have a relationship with Jesus. If I'm being honest with you, knowing there's a goal to this growth, knowing there's some kind of goal that comes with growing in love, knowledge, and discernment, that makes this whole process a lot more enjoyable for me. It makes me able to find joy in everything, such as reading scripture, prayer, worship, evangelism. It makes every circumstance have some hint of joy to it. As James says, count it all joy when you encounter trials of various kinds. We know that there's a goal in mind. We know there is something that we are working to. We know that God will complete the work that he has begun in us. Then we can have joy in all circumstances. We can have joy in every discipline God calls us to do as believers. Not to remain loved by him, but because we're loved by him. I'm reminded of Don Whitney's illustration uh, from his book, Spiritual Disciplines in the Christian Life. He gives an illustration of this imaginary character named Kevin, who's six years old. And Kevin has signed up for guitar lessons. But there's just one problem. He finds them to be boring, pointless, and joyless. Because as he's having these guitar lessons, he notices that all his friends are outside playing, and all he wants to do is play with them. Well, one day during one of his guitar lessons, an angel comes to Kevin and takes him to Carnegie Hall. And while they're at Carnegie Hall, Kevin witnesses this master guitar player who is playing some of the most beautiful music he's ever heard, who's making it look easy, and Kevin is just blown away. He just keeps saying, wow. Wow. And the angel looks at Kevin and says, Kevin, do you know who this is? And Kevin says, no, I don't. Who is it? And the angel says, this is you. This is you in a few years if you keep practicing. And then the angel took Kevin back. Now, do you think after that that Kevin found his guitar lessons to be pointless or joyless or meaningless? No, he found them joyful. He found them to have purpose. He worked harder than he ever had before. Why? Because he knew there was a goal. He knew what was the result of his lessons. He knew what was the result of his growth. In the same way, you and I as believers, we know the goal of our growth. We know that we are not just growing aimlessly or pointlessly. We know that we're not called to read scripture and pray and evangelize and worship in some kind of pointless way that has no meaning. No, we're called to do those things because there is a goal in mind that we are to grow in love, grow in our knowledge of God, the gospel, what the gospel calls us to do so we may approve that which is superior and we be found pure and blameless on the day of Christ. There is a very real goal to our growth. It's not pointless. It's not meaningless. The trials we face on this earth aren't pointless. They have purpose. They are growing us into the people that God has saved us to be. And so you and I, in the midst of whatever life throws at us, in the midst of whatever we are doing right now, we can find joy in our growth knowing that God's not going to give up on us. He will complete his work and that there is a goal to our growth that we may grow into the image of Christ more and more to the praise and glory of God. This is the joy that we have. If we are aware of the goal of our growth, this is the joy that comes in our growth. This is the joy that we can have as believers, as people who are in Christ. But like I said, this is, this is joy for those who are in Christ. I mean, if you're not a believer, then you can't grow in Christ because you're not in Christ. But you can be. You see, if you will repent of your sin, turn away from your sin, believe that Jesus is who he says he is, Believe that he did die on the cross and forgive you of your sins. That he did rise again to raise you to walk in the newness of life. If you will repent and believe that, then you will be saved. And you can begin your growth process. You can begin to grow in Christ. But if you're a believer and you're listening, I understand at times that this growth process may seem meaningless. It might seem boring at times. But if we, 
We'll have assurance in the God who grows us. And if we will be aware of the goal of our growth, we will find joy in our growth. We will find joy in enduring through this life and enduring through everything, knowing that God is still working in us and that God's not done with us. We can find joy knowing that as we grow in Christ, that we eagerly await the day to hear those words from Christ and we get to be with him for all eternity. Welcome home, my child, and well done, good and faithful servant. There is joy in our growth as believers. So would you find joy and be active in your growth this morning? Let's pray together. Father, you have not called us to grow in Christ for some meaningless reason. But there is purpose. Everything you call us to do is to grow us in the image of Christ, to grow us in holiness. And God, I thank you that the work that you have begun in us as believers, you will bring to completion. And I pray that we will find joy in that. That we will find joy by having assurance in you. That we will have joy by being aware of the goal of our growth. Father, I pray for those who aren't believers who are listening this morning, that you will convict them of their sin and draw them to you in salvation. Father, we will worship you now in response to your word. In Jesus' name, amen.
morning. I hope that you have seen Jesus in a greater way. Um, I pray that we will have a joy in this growth that we pursue over the coming weeks. Uh, I know that church looks different now, and it has looked different for several weeks, but I pray that we will continue to be unified and continue to pursue this joy that Rio just preached about. Let me close the service by praying. Jesus, once again, uh, we just thank you for uh, allowing us to worship you, allowing us to come before you. Uh, we thank you for your sacrifice. You died on the cross and rose again so that we can have life. I pray that we would uh, pursue joy this week, that we would pursue joy even in the menial things, even in the, the, the painful things of growth. God, I pray that you would be with us this week, keep us safe, and again, I pray that you would bring us back together soon. In Jesus' name, amen.